Canada has pulled out of the World Hockey Tournament, and it looks as if it will be some time before there will be another game like this one played with the Soviet Union on Boxing Day. The World Hockey Tournament this year will be held in Stockholm, not Winnipeg and Montreal. Canada has withdrawn from the tournament after a bitter dispute in Geneva over the issue of whether professional players should be included in our team. But the Olympic Committee President Avery Brundage has warned that the other countries would endanger their amateur status and their chances of playing in the 1972 Olympics if they take on the Canadian ice hockey professionals. It seems to me that this double standard where they're allowed to, uh, under the sanction of, of uh, rather ludicrous rules of the International Hockey uh, Association, that they can have some countries field pros and insist on Canada sending over a uh, young man without the same experience to me. Swedish Ulf Sterner, the first European playing in the NHL, appeared in Stockholm after being re-amateurized. Neither he or the goalie Leif Honk and Holmquist were able to interrupt the series of Soviet triumphs. By 1971, they had won nine consecutive world titles and thus broke the pre-war record of Canada. The Big Red Machine was powered by the superior Troika of Mikhailov, Petrov, Karlamov in the 70s. In the first game of the famous eight-game summit series between Canada and the Soviet Union, this line scored four goals out of seven. Karlamov, a very tricky player, gets the scores! Karlamov led a bullet drive goal. Passes to Mihailov, coming in on goal. Oh, he scores! Mihailov, and the game Canada was faced with a shock on September 2nd, 1972, the first time the motherland of hockey was able to ice a team with their best professionals. Very few fans believed that this team would be able to overcome the unfavorable results in Moscow. I remember getting on that airplane and all the guys, it was a different atmosphere. We were cocky. We were really cocky. And it was like, that's it. We're going over there and we're going to kick buns. But Canada was close to disaster after an additional loss in game five in Moscow. Canada was criticizing the European referees. They felt they were unfair and they penalized them for actions that would not be called in the NHL. They objected mainly against referee Jupp Kampala from West Germany. Give him two minutes penalty for elbowing. Paris say, say to me, you bloody German referee. I say, okay, I give you two minutes more. Canada finally turned its emotional energy into a better direction. From the fifth game, they went undefeated. I just can't help it. That's the way I feel. It's not a game. It wasn't a game. It wasn't a series. It was our society against their society. With 34 seconds left in the last game, the score was 5-5. to The Soviet Union would claim a series win with this result. And then came Paul Henderson. Almost every day of my life, a Canadian will come up to me and shake my hand and say, you know, thank you for one of the greatest thrills of my life. And I don't really think you can signal anybody out, although some did play so well, because it was a team effort, and they came back in such a magnificent way, and they won it in a magnificent way as well. The Soviet World Championship hegemony was broken also by Czechoslovak hockey players. Their golden era commenced on home ice in Prague, 1972. Yuri Holicek, Yuri Holik, Vladimir Zurilla, Václav Nedomansky, Vladimir Martinets and František Pospisil stopped the nine-year golden period of the Soviets and they won their third trophy. They waited for a long 23 years. Defeating the Soviets also belongs to the most memorable experience of Swede, Boria Salming. The happiness with all the people around it and, and, and uh, the guys, you know, in the team, and it was amazing. And, uh, and you, you knew what, and then when you seen it, and you knew what, how big it was to, to beat the Russians on the ice. Salming is the first European who became a star in the NHL. 
16,000 fans delivered a standing ovation, lasting five minutes to him during the inaugural Canada Cup in 1976, the first open hockey tournament where amateur or professional status didn't matter. The spectators learned to appreciate the skill of the reigning world champions from Czechoslovakia. Zorilla shuts down every Canadian attack. When Novi scores the only goal of the game, Canada is shaken, but both teams make it to the best of three final. Head coach Scotty Bowman knows that he must find a clue to the effective defense of the opponent. After the first final, it seems that he has found it. Canada outplays the Czechoslovak players in all aspects. Only victory for the home team is expected also in the next game. Canada scores late in the second final to salvage a 4-4 tie. Daryl Sittler scores the winning goal in overtime. The isolation of Canada during the presidential period of John O'Hearn is detrimental to the development of international hockey. A new spirit is introduced with the arrival of Gunter Sabetsky. After a seven-year-long break, Canada is back in the IIHF World Championships in Vienna in 1977. However, the fans in Vienna are disappointed. The players, led by Phil Esposito, show poor discipline and are beaten by the Soviets 11-1 and 8-1. The team of the Maple Leaf shows its better face only when playing against Czechoslovakia. No one believes that Sweden could defeat the Soviets for the second time in the same tournament, and this is needed for the Czechoslovaks to regain the world title from 1976. But the three crowns succeeded, thanks to a hat-trick by Roland Eriksson, as well as the excellent performance of goaltender Goran Hagosta. Czechoslovak players believed only during the last seconds. The failure of the Soviet team led to a change behind the bench. New coach Viktor Tikhonov trusts the existing roster. The Soviets again smashed their opponents in 1978 and 1979, and it seems that everything is as it was. Tikhonov and his team regrouped for the 1981 Canada Cup, an excellent opportunity for revenge. Canada is determined to repeat the victory from the 1976 Canada Cup, but Tikhonov has drawn a secret trump from his sleeve. Probably the best unit of all times appears on the scene, the KLM line. Defenders Fetisov and Kasatinov, and Makarov, Larionov and Krutov on the fence. They play nearly without looking, but this is not simply a result of mechanical drill. Each of them has his own talent and unrepeatable style. The Soviet team pounded Canada 8-1 in Montreal, the most devastating defeat ever for a best national team that Canada could assemble. <laughs> 